Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to feature a new design that I've developed for a super tweeter. And this is a horn lens number 2258. And so I purchased the Fostex T900A, which is pretty high up in their model range. It's a 82 millimeter diameter body. And so the idea here is to do the same thing that we had done with the T96A tweeter uh, and replace the front portion of the tweeter with a uh, custom designed unit. And the goal here is to improve the overall sound quality. And so in this video, I'm going to review the design and then look at the objective test data to see if it does in fact improve uh, the test data and by virtue of that, also the sound quality. So let's get right into it. So you can see here, this is the body of the tweeter. It also has uh, included with it dowels that the tweeter sits on. And so I'll show you those in a, in a second. So the whole front of the tweeter there is brass and it's quite a beautiful super tweeter. The bullet is also brass. And you'll notice here the horn flare geometry that Fostex has decided to go with. It's a gradual flare and then it abruptly changes uh, like we saw with the Fostex T96A. And so I had developed a new horn lens, 2258. So I'm just gonna open up the drawing here so you can see the overall uh, size of the tweeter. So it's uh, 92 millimeters by 140 millimeters wide. So it's about twice the size of the horn lens that we had made for the T96A. And so the idea here, again, similar design goals, is to distribute the edge diffraction around the perimeter of the, of the body of the tweeter so that you avoid that circular shape. And also you can see here the uh, flare geometry that we're going with is uh, uses my ES horn flare geometry again. And so we're going with a large body as well because what we want to do is allow the sound to propagate away from the, the uh, throat of the horn and then we don't want any disruptions uh, for a few milliseconds in the time domain. So getting that sound wave away, uh, allowing it to propagate away over one or two milliseconds. And so we can see that uh, in the step response in a, in, a, in a few minutes. So you can see here, um, I've gone to great lengths to ensure physical accuracy and also to fill in the void that is formed by the, the diaphragm. So you can see the design uh, actually has an indent into where the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is this area here. Okay, so I'm going to go back and show more of that. Um, if we look at the uh, tweeter with it with it uh, disassembled, you can see if I scroll down, so you have um, a flat area and then it falls down into the uh, voice coil area and it's kind of hard to see in the pictures, but um, what we, we needed to do was to machine a feature into the wood that follows the the front face curvature of the diaphragm. So we've had to machine this very cleanly, very accurately, and so there's quite a bit of effort to went in to machining this as accurately as what was required. Um, so here's the front of the horn. This is just in walnut. It's been sanded, but it hasn't been finished. Normally we put on a few coats of wax to really uh, bring out the wood, so it will look quite beautiful. We handpicked um, some walnut that had very distinctive high contrast grain, uh, just uh, so that it looks uh, as beautiful as the stock tweeter, which is quite difficult um, considering the appearance. It's quite a beautiful tweeter in stock form. And so we wanted to come up with something that was just as, as attractive. So um, just continuing on. So in addition to this uh, super tweeter, we also are working on a project for a complete speaker system for a customer. And so I'll just scroll down to show you what that looks like. So you can see it here, it's a backloaded horn 15 inch field coil from Supervox. It has the ES450 by radial on top. And then the idea here is that the super tweeter comes in at around eight kilohertz. And so we've incorporated uh, grooves into the top of the bi radial that receives the standard dowels that are that are included with the super tweeter. So you can see it perched right in there. So that just provides uh, physical location of the super tweeter and proper time alignment. So you can see here in the design of the horn lens, we've recessed out the dowels 
uh, so that it gives the dowels the proper uh, allows the dowels to properly support the tweeter and provide the proper center of gravity uh, of the assembly. Okay, so you can see it here. Um, this horn hasn't been sanded. This is just out of the CNC, and so you can see it here installed and then in the back. Okay, so there we have. Uh, we did two pairs of these. Uh, super tweeters. Here's a rendering of it. I think that's in mahogany. So I just have a few more pictures of the project itself. That's a three-way backloaded horn, and so you can see here um, just the the idea with it. So we have the uh, logo. This particular backloaded horn project, not to diverge too much or deviate too much from uh, the focus of this blog video. Um, this is 2183, the backloaded horn. And so it's uh, a design that I had come up with. And so you can see the back of the ES450, which is custom designed for this specific project. It uses the BNC DCM50 large format mid-range compression driver. So it will cover from 450 hertz up to around eight kilohertz. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the measurement side and we're gonna directly compare the stock tweeter against the addition of the 2258 horn lens. And so you can see here, I've actually overlaid the two impedance curves between the two. So the green is the stock tweeter, both for the phase response and for the impedance. And in, sorry, I have that backwards. <laughs> I always get it backwards. So the green is the uh, addition of the 2258 horn lens. And then the red and blue is the stock tweeter. And so uh, from a phase response, we can see that the the addition of the horn lens is providing a flatter phase response. And then we have here, you can see that we have this peak reduced in the five kilohertz region. Of note as well is the uh, eight kilohertz region. You can see here that we actually have a flatter impedance profile through the actual bandwidth of the tweeter, which is from about seven kilohertz up to 30 kilohertz. So you can see here that our, our impedance, we're loading the uh, diaphragm much more evenly through this region, uh, which is a really good sign that we're on the right track. So next we look at the frequency response. So here you can see the overlay, the red is the stock tweeter, the blue is the frequency response with the addition of the horn lens. And so if we zoom in, we can see that the response here has a dip centered at around eight kilohertz. There's about a minus five dB dip. Um, we can see our response is much more linear. It's almost a perfect linear response. And then even looking at the upper treble in the 11 or 12 kilohertz region, we actually see a gain in sensitivity by about two dB. And so this is going to have a uh, reduction in distortion by adding that sensitivity. So next we're gonna look at the off-axis performance. Um, so we're going to measure the 0, 15, 30, and 45 degree um, frequency response measurements. And so this is the stock tweeter. You can see here that there's quite a lot of congestion in, this, in the eight kilohertz region. And then as you move into the upper treble, we see the nar a narrowing of the directivity. And to highlight this, I've done a off-axis colored polar map at five degree increments. And just a little side note, to do this in Arda, you actually have to have um, a frequency response that's relatively flat through the mid range into the treble. Otherwise, you're not able to normalize the on-axis response. And so I had to set up the uh, super tweeter on top of a, a standard two-way bookshelf speaker, and then using DSP at uh, implementing a crossover point at around four kilohertz. And so um, the bookshelf speaker played up to four kilohertz and then above that, the uh, super tweeter took over. And that was simply to allow me to actually generate this polar map. And so just going back to what we saw earlier, you can see the congestion there at eight kilohertz. And so the polar map highlights this even further by seeing how much energy is projected into the room at this region compared to the rest of the frequency spectrum. And so I've just uh, shown here with dashed lines overlaid over the polar map just to show um, the, how quickly the directivity narrows from basically omnidirectional down to about a 90 degree listening window at around uh, 20 kilohertz. Okay, so let's look at what the horn lens does to the frequency response off axis. And so you can see here 
Uh, this is the result with the addition of the horn lens. And so you can see that we have the blue is the on axis and then 15, 30, and 45 off. So you can see that the response is much more well behaved and that it's also providing a much more even power response. And so to highlight this, I simply took the, um, I took the two polar maps and split them down the middle. So the, the, the above half on the polar map is the stock tweeter and then the bottom half is with the 2258 horn lens. And so you can see how it's uh, creating a more even response, especially in the 20 kilohertz and above but um, the line there is much more what you would refer to as constant directivity. Okay, so looking at the time domain, we started, we started by looking at the step response. Here the step response is for the stock tweeter, and you can see that there's quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of stuff happening there, and then when we move to the 2258 lens, it cleans up slightly. Looking at the CSD plot for the stock tweeter, you can see that it actually is quite clean. Uh, but then it even cleans up further when we do the do the uh, 2258 horn lens. Looking at the burst decay, we do see some uh, anomalies across its bandwidth, and then with the lens, it's basically become perfectly clean. The last thing that I tested uh, was the intermodulation distortion. I would have liked to have done the uh, Gedley GM distortion. However, it only goes up to about 10 kilohertz. And so the focus of this is to look at what happens in the 8 up to 20 kilohertz. And so here you can see, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. For the stock uh, tweeter, I played it with an 85 dB uh, test signal at 1 meter. And so we can see here that the IMD is about minus 65 uh, dB at the 10 kilohertz region. When we move to the 2258 horn lens, uh, we can see that the IMD is reduced somewhat. So you can see here the noise products and then down here they're reduced slightly. So we see an IMD improvement from 65 dB to, to 71 dB of dynamic range. So uh, so it's, it's reducing the uh, distortion as well. And so I did expect to see that uh, when we saw that the sensitivity increased on the tweeter. So in conclusion, um, the horn lens number 2258 achieves its design goals. Um, these design goals are summarized below, which is smoother frequency response, even power response off axis, faster de decay times in the time domain, lower distortion, and higher sensitivity. So I think I covered it all. Um, I'll be using this tweeter in this project, like I mentioned, with the three-way backloaded horn. And I'll get uh, some more listening time on the new horn lens and be able to provide some feedback on, on how that works. Um, but in the interim, there you have it, test data on horn number 2258. Take care and have a great day.